Hello there, everyone, and welcome to the Kennedy School and the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. I'm David Elwood, and we have a terrific evening this evening. And uh, you can see we're packed to the gills, and many, many people tried to get here that aren't here now. Uh, part of what makes this special, of course, is we have three extraordinarily uh, significant figures who have had very, very senior level experience in economics at the White House. We have uh, one person here who's recently written, written a quite definitive book on a prosperity. Of course, we have next to him the person that wrote the book on economics uh, that many of you are in the midst of reading or have read. And next to him, we have someone who's put his name on a whole lot of dollar bills. Uh, so it's, it's quite a collection. Uh, 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 Larry will do the introdu introductions of our two primary uh, guests here, but I want to use this occasion to introduce the president. And of course, it's a particularly significant time, and it's really quite a great honor. And Larry, uh, by now, you're quite familiar with all his achievements. He was a child prodigy in all kinds of different ways. He uh, one of the early, youngest persons ever tenured at Harvard University. It actually was true, I believe, that they did insist that he finish his dissertation before he get tenure, which is one of those rules that they imposed. Uh, more truth to that than you realize. Uh, the, uh, he won the John Bates Clark Award for the best economist under 40. He became the, the uh, chief economist of the World Bank, ultimately treasury secretary, and a host of achievements along the way. Obviously, we're even more familiar with his remarkable time as president here uh, of the university. Now, I've heard Larry say that he managed in five years to probably generate more than five years worth of controversy, but he certainly generated more than five years worth of achievements. And when you look at the remarkable things that he did, ranging from uh, the focus on internationalization, a big a uh, great deal of energy devoted to public service and expanding fellowships of all sorts uh, for people that are doing public uh, fellowships. Strong emphasis on the sciences and bringing the, the uh, university uh, into the forefront on scientific research. Alston, everything that's involved with that. An incredible commitment to undergraduates in all kinds of different dimensions as best evidenced by the fact that among his strongest uh, supporters were the newspaper staff, the Crimson. I mean, this is just, the earth has been turned upside down. Uh, and uh, I could go on and on and on. He's been a very good friend of the Kennedy School. Uh, he has remarkable energy, remarkable intellect, and perhaps more than anything, he's got a really, has been, uh, had really transformative vision. And so I just want uh, us to give him a warm welcome. He also, by the way, had one other achievement which he cited himself, and I'm just gonna quote it again. I believe he goes down history as the only Harvard president never to have lost a Harvard-Yale game. And so with that, a warm welcome for President Larry Summers. Thank you very much, uh, David, for those uh, kind words. Uh, I probably won't have occasion to use this joke uh, that, many more, that many more times, but uh, I'm reminded of uh, something that uh, President Clinton uh, once said. Um, I had uh, occasion to introduce him at the IMF World Bank meetings, and I explained his many virtues in the economic and financial uh, area in a way that I hoped was suitably, com suitably complimentary. And uh, he stood up and he said, Larry, Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for that generous introduction. You have just reminded me of one of my first laws of political life. Whenever possible, be introduced by someone who you appointed to high office. <laughs> Let me just uh, say that I've done uh, some things right and some things wrong in the last five years, but one of the most right things I did in the last five years was to appoint David Elwood 
as the dean of the Kennedy School, and he is doing an excellent job. And all of you at the Institute of Politics and at the Kennedy School are very lucky uh, to have David Elwood as your dean. It is um, my pleasure tonight uh, to return to thinking about and discussing a set of subjects that I've been uh, very involved with over my uh, career, the set of issues around uh, maintaining, creating, and extending uh, American prosperity. And my task will be to moderate and then to briefly question our two uh, distinguished panelists, and I feel particularly fortunate um, because they are two very good friends of mine. Greg Mankiw is the former chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, where he served uh, under President George W. Bush between 2003 and 2005. He's known here as a professor of economics at uh, Harvard and the teacher of our enormously popular and successful Ec-10 uh, course. He, his textbooks, Principles of Economics and Macroeconomics, have sold one million uh, copies worldwide and are translated into 17 uh, languages. And during his time as a doctoral student at uh, MIT, he was generous enough to co-author uh, three economics papers uh, with uh, me. So please welcome Greg Mankiw. <laughs> Our other speaker is um, my good friend, uh, Gene Sperling, who served as National Economic Advisor to President Clinton and Director of the National Economic Council from 1996 to 2000, after serving as the Deputy at the National Economic Council from 1993 to 1996. He is currently serving as a Senior Fellow at both the Council on Foreign Relations and the Committee on American Progress, as well as as a commentator for Bloomberg. He's a native of Ann Arbor, Michigan, and graduated from the University of Minnesota and obtained his law degree from Yale Law School. If you ask the question of all the people, the President of the United States, the staff, uh, of all the professional people who worked in the West Wing of the White House between January 20th, 1993 and January 20th, 2001, which single individual logged the most hours in the West Wing? There is no question but that the answer to that is Gene Sperling. There is no one who worked harder, more selflessly, more thoughtfully to push forward every aspect of uh, the economic policy that President Clinton and his team uh, tried uh, to pursue. His devotion to public service is unlike uh, anything uh, that I have observed. He fought what he fought was the good fight while he was in government, and he has continued to pursue his commitment to vitally important uh, issues. Uh, publishing recently a new book, The Pro-Growth Progressive, An Economic Strategy for Shared Prosperity, that has not yet caught up with Greg Mankiw's one million copies, <laughs> but there's time. We will uh, begin with Gene Sperling. Gene, the challenges of American prosperity. Thank you. Well, Larry, uh, I was glad you went on and said uh, some of the uh, 
some other things other than logging a lot of hours because it did, it did remind me a little when I was in the war room and looked like we were going to win and they started writing article after article on George Stephanopoulos and James Carville. And uh, the articles on George were pretty good, you know, how good looking he was, how smart he was. So I said, God, I'd like to get one of those articles. And the people said, well, just wait, just wait. So the first article comes out, and it's not about being good looking, not about being smart. It's just about how long I work, how much, what time I come in, what time I leave. <laughs> Guy on my staff says, don't worry. Next article will be better. The next one comes out, and it's got it's a story where everybody is surveying how many cups of coffee they think I drink. Again, nothing about <laughs> smart accomplishment. So anyways, the same staffer then posted both on the door and put a sign above, and it said, Sperling, he's not particularly good, but he's here a lot. <laughs> um, Telling a, uh, uh, I, I was watching Cherno on his book on Hamilton, and someone said, you know, give us the gist in two minutes. And he kind of went pale, and he went, I wrote 900 pages. I worked for 80 years on this. You want me two minutes? Uh, my book's not 900 uh, words, but 900 pages. But uh, let me try to give, uh, do my best at, at, at getting through uh, a few of the main points that I'd like to make. Uh, I start the book by saying that when I was in the White House, I always wanted uh, our, our State of the Union theme to be, we should grow together or we're going to grow apart, um, which I thought was a great theme. And in fact, I was going to name my book Growing Together <clears throat> until my wife pointed out that that was also the name of several parenting books. Um, <laughs> whether Growing Together is a good State of the Union title or a good book title, it is what our aspiration is my aspiration, I think, in the United States. We're not for growth and productivity if it were simply to go to a royal family. Uh, the, the, the gist of, of our country has always been the idea of a rising, strong, inclusive middle class that makes more room for people coming in. And John F. Kennedy's line, a rising tide lifts all boats, uh, I don't know if that's an automatic assumption, but I think that does summarize what the core aspiration for economic policy uh, should be consistent with the values that I think we care about, which are that we are in a, a place where each generation can do better than the generation before them, that no child's life would be severely dis diminished simply by the accident of their birth, that everybody can move up, uh, and that there's a degree of economic dignity that comes with a degree of hard work and education. And trying to keep uh, those values alive in our economy, I think, is of the most paramount importance. And I would say that the question of whether or not whether we're going to have growth or productivity growth, because I believe we will have both in, in the global economy in the U.S., but whether or not that will lead to a strengthening middle class or a hollowing out of the middle class, I think will be the paramount economic issue for the next decade, at least. Now, for me, one of the reasons that I wanted to write this book or been wanting to talk about these issues was that I feel too much that when you look at the debate that goes on in Washington, that too much of it is lodged in one of two camps, of which I don't think either is confronting where we need to be. One seems to assume that if we could simply repeal enough trade agreements, uh, we could slow down the process of globalization. This is not a defense of everything on trade. But the question is, but, but I, I fear that that is not the ultimate solution. The other camp seems to believe that if you could just make the capital gains rate lower and government smaller, you would have growth. And I think that what is missing uh, is the perspective that takes much more seriously the power and inevitability of markets and globalization, and yet still believes there can be a stronger role for government and making sure that you have a rising tide lift, lifting all boats. And I think when you take that perspective, I have to say, it doesn't always lead to easy answers. But I think at least we're focusing on the right questions. I think that uh, you could repeal NAFTA, or you could take the capital gains rate to zero. And I don't think anybody serious would think that is either of those are going to fundamentally 
deal with the challenges that we face and whether we're going to have a strong and growing middle class in the future. Now, let me do my best to try to raise three or four, four issues before, we, before I turn it over to Greg. One thing is, I do believe that we have to get out of this divorce court this debate on globalization. And by divorce court, I mean both sides simply marshal the arguments against each other. There is no room for nuance. There is, this is the, what I call in the book, the, if you're for trade and globalization, you play the discounting pain game. You talk about larger macroeconomic trends. You ignore the pain and difficulties that don't fit in. If you're against globalization, you play the trade over blame game. You blame everything bad in a particular economy, society, on the particular trade or global arrangement you want. Now, I've said before in this discussion that I think the debate often ends up being a two-party system, the sky is falling party or the don't worry, be happy party. And I've argued that there's a lot of reason to have a third party movement, which might be a more of a humility party on some of these issues. Uh, so if you're on the progressive side, or you're on, tend to be more on the globalization skepticism side, there's some uncomfortable realities out there. The 1990s, with the increase of globalization, actually saw widespread wage growth across the board and a decrease in poverty. Um, uh, the WTO round is the greatest hope for reducing the agriculture subsidies that could alleviate a significant degree of poverty uh, in Africa. Um, the, uh, uh, the fact is, is that imports are job dislocating, but also lead to lower prices for the poorest families. And finally, most importantly, the humility, I think, on, on our side, on the progressive side, is that the, that the openness to the idea that stopping the flow of change and innovation may be impossible and that while it can protect and help some people in the short term, it is not so clear that it will lead to the type of innovation and competition that will create the help new jobs of the future. In other words, it's not clear that even if you wanted to or thought this was the right policy to slow the pace of change, that you could. Humility on the other side, I think, means recognizing that one, uh, we're in a new world. You can say that, oh, we're always worrying that the middle class is going to be hollowing out. Uh, Larry Katz likes to say how the North was worried that the South was going to take all the middle class jobs after the Civil War. I grew up in Michigan. We certainly thought Japan was going to clean our clock. Well, the fact is China and India make up 40% of the global workforce. Japan and South Korea make up 3%. The degree of integration through technology is unprecedented in human history. And the fact is, is that there is more evidence right now that there is greater polarization in the workforce, that the fear that there'll be more division between the super educated and those who simply have to do jobs that require you to be here and that the middle class will hollow out that losing a middle class job is a more threatening experience in the sense that you have a harder time finding jobs at near wages. Those facts are out there and we have to acknowledge them uh, and have to take seriously. And I think that for people who take much more of just a pro-growth, pro-market side, they have to also understand that if you don't take this seriously, that you could start to have a loss of support for open market systems. You could start to have people willing to take less risks in, their, in the global economy. And finally, and this is one I take to heart, which is that it's very easy when you're sitting at Harvard or a think tank to talk about larger macroeconomic trends. Bill Clinton used to always say that if somebody says uh, an issue isn't about money, his iron law was they're always talking about somebody else's problem. Well, I think my iron law would be that anytime somebody is looking at job dislocation problems and they say it will all work itself out sooner or later, you know they're talking about someone else's job. And it is very easy to sit here and say, we should just reduce subsidies for textiles and, 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 and agriculture, and that may be a good thing overall in terms of reducing global poverty. But let's be honest, when I say that, I sound humanitarian. How's it gonna affect me? Lower prices. How's it gonna affect the people in North Carolina or South Carolina? Their job, their house, their, their community, we got to be honest about the fact when we're talking about things, who bears the pain 
and be honest about how we would react and what we would do if we had to bear some of it. James Carville, I know, was here yesterday. Carville used to have a great line about kind of elites in trade. He said, you know, I would just love to see a, an, an analysis come back one day where it said, this trade agreement uh, is great for the macro economy. It's great for foreign relations. It's good in every way, except that it would keep half of Washington law partners from getting their children into private school. Um, and he said, I wonder what the reaction would be then in Washington, in elite circles then. So I think we have to break out of that divorce court. Now, that I think goes to, to a second point, which is that if you're not looking for the simple solution on either lower tax cuts or stopping globalization, you've got to start asking a bit of the harder questions of where exactly and how exactly do we do the right type of things in terms of encouraging more of the job creation here in a world where we don't always know, or by being the United States, you by definition do not know what the new jobs of the future are gonna be. And if you're debating whether that means taking the health cost of, of healthcare off employers more, if you're debating whether we should be multiplying R&D and connecting it to the uh, universities or entrepreneurship, if you're debating whether our tax system should give more tax incentives for job creating here, I think at least you're having the right conversation. And it may not be an easy solution for people who want to hear either how you're gonna save their job or what's the new job, but I think it's the right place to be. Third issue, and I wish I could go on and on, but I'm sure we'll come back on those issues. Third issue I wanna raise is there are disturbing tendencies in the economy now that we are moving more towards winner take all, loser lose all outcomes. I said before, there's more evidence that when you lose a middle class job, you're likely to take a 20 or 30 or 40 percent hit. On the other hand, people at the very top are doing extremely well. Uh, and you, many of you saw the Krugman piece or the Robert Gordon article that talks about how much of the growth has gone to the top slice of the top 1 percent. Now, there's not a, I don't have a silver bullet answer on that. But one thing we've always had in our country is a progressive tax system. We don't sit around and decide, you know, does Oprah deserve her money, which she certainly does, versus somebody who just got it by luck. Uh, we have a free economy and a free society, but we do say that if you have benefited and benefited the most, that you would pay back a bit more so that other people could have first chances, second or third chances. That moderates winner-take-all outcomes. We are now moving towards a system that exacerbates winner-take-all outcomes. So for example, two twin brothers, year 2000, they go take two different jobs, equally good jobs at the time. One goes to Lucent, one goes to Google. The, job worker guy, the brother who goes to Lucent is on the unemployment line, retraining, fights to get back a $60,000 a year job. The brother who went to Google has $2 million in stock options. Well, that's life. Those things happen. But now what does our tax system do? The brother making 60,000 struggling to get back would pay an effective tax rate of 23 to 24%. The brother of $2 million, if he can get 6% conservative and dividend capital gains, can make 120,000 a year and pay a 15% rate. And if tax reform people had the right, if, if the movement in tax reform went the way some want, they'd be paying zero. So we have a system whereby we want to ex we will exacerbate the winner take all, and if people had their way with zero capital gains and zero estate tax, we'd actually have a system where once you got any wealth, you could watch that wealth accumulate and accumulate at a lower tax rate than those people struggling to work. That is the exact wrong direction that we should be going in. And my last point is to say, and this I say to progressives as much as to anyone else, while we have to do more to have a broader safety net, in the globalization, uh, while we have to do more to make sure we don't have a winner-take-all economy and a winner-take-all tax system, we cannot, uh, we cannot just be the party that is there for you when something bad happens in your life. You know, that's the most important thing is to have friends that are there for you when something bad happens in your life. But most people would also like to have friends who are there for you when something good happens. And we say, oh my god, why aren't people voting their economic interest? Well, a lot of times they're voting their economic dreams, their economic aspirations. I believe, Greg will disagree on this, that our critique of the Bush ownership society from Social Security privatization down the road has been right on point. 
The problem is you can be right on every critique, but if all people hear is you critiquing investment options, why should we be shocked that they don't think we're the ones who are going to be there to help them create a nest egg? Now, I've proposed a universal 401k. I don't have time to go into it now. But the point is, is that, is that 50% of workers do not have a pension in a particular year. 80% of, of uh, part-time workers, 65, 70% of African-American Hispanic workers. If you're progressive, these are the workers we're supposed to be fighting for. Yet when it comes to saving and wealth creation, we are all critique. It is never at the front of our agenda. Huey Long was the greatest populist in American history, the greatest wealth basher. But Huey went somewhere, and Larry, I think you should try this in your next place. He had a theme song. He started everything with a theme song. And his theme song was, every man a king, every man a king, you can be a millionaire. And it's very interesting that the greatest populist still understood that when he was appealing to people, he was still appealing to their upward aspirations. We have an upside down system that gives the greatest amount of tax incentives to those who make the most, and we give the least to those who struggle. That's the way our tax system is designed. We should be leading progressives to make sure that we have less wealth and equality, get more of our workers, so that when we critique the Social Security privatization plan, that's not the end of the discussion. We then say, here's how you do it right. Here's how you do a progressive tax credit, a one-to-one -one credit, so everybody has a universal 401k. So I think this is the challenge. We have got to be honest about the realities of globalization and ask ourselves, what are the policies that will help promote the most fertile ground to create the new middle class jobs in the future? And then we have to be able to broaden the degree of security for people in between jobs so they buy into the global economy, they don't suffer as much, but at the same time, not make people think that that's all we're for, that we're not also for helping them also take risks, create wealth, and move up. And I think that is our challenge. And my last point is I will simply say that while Greg and I may disagree on many, many things, if there's one thing I think we strongly agree on, I'll take the liberty of saying, is that it is one hell of a great loss for this incredible student body that this guy is not going to continue to be your president. Thank you. Gene, thank, Gene, uh, thank you especially for, uh, for that last. I have learned a thing or two. I hope you meant to suggest that my theme song become every man a king, every woman a queen, <laughs> said with equal <laughs> emphasis. And, and, and no, that wasn't prearranged. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Mankiw. Uh, thank you. It is, it is a delight and an honor to be here uh, with these two gentlemen. Uh, I've known uh, Larry Summers for a very long time. Um, everyone in their life has a few teachers who stand out as being particularly influential uh, on their, their path uh, through life. And, and one of those teachers for me was Larry Summers. I came to MIT as a grad student in 1980. It was a, it was a very fortunate time because it was a very brief window when Larry was already a great economist but not quite a famous one yet. So I got to know him during that brief window, and I've learned a lot. And those of you who are reading, reading my textbook, I can point to specific passages where I could say, I learned this from Larry Summers. Uh, Gene Sperling's book's a great book. Uh, I encourage you to buy it. Uh, I won't promote my own book here, because most of you have to buy it already. Um, <laughs> but you'll find it makes good Christmas presents. Um, uh, so let me just turn to the, the, uh, what's going on in the economy. I want to basically give a brief overview of how I see the economy today, and I'll talk about three challenges that we face going forward, and some of the challenges are going to resonate uh, with some of the topics that Gene uh, talked about. The, the economy today is fundamentally in very sound shape. Uh, unemployment is low, below 5%. That is low by historical standards. Inflation uh, is low. Its core, core inflation is running between 2 and 3%. That's what most uh, central banks uh, view as their target. Uh, productivity growth has been incredibly strong since 1995, and since 2000, it's been even stronger. Over the past five years, it's averaged uh, over 3% per year in the non-farm business sector, again, well above the historical average. Uh, we've enjoyed tremendous stability in, in the macroeconomy for the past uh, two decades. We've had two long expansions interrupted by one brief uh, and very mild uh, recession. 
So from a macroeconomic perspective, the sort of things that, that I as a macroeconomist study, the economy looks uh, terrific. Uh, but let me talk about some of the challenges that, that arise when you start looking uh, beneath the, uh, the macroeconomic statistics. Uh, and the three areas I want to talk about are the, the, the uh, growing backlash against globalization, which as I know is a topic these two gentlemen have also uh, th thought a lot about, a rise in uh, income inequality, and the uh, uh, looming budgetary squeeze that Gene didn't talk about, but I know he's, he's very aware of. It's, it's now a platitude that uh, our economy is increasingly globalized, but it's not just a platitude, it's, 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 it's a fact. Uh, imports uh, have, as a share of GDP have, were about 4% in 1960 and are about 16% percent today and every indication that's going to continue uh, rising. And most policy wonks, uh, like, like Gene and I, think this is a good thing. This is really not a partisan issue among policy wonks. Uh, both Republican policy wonks and Democratic policy wonks are in favor of increasing globalization. Uh, the reasons are, pr are pretty straightforward. You learn them in the first week of Act 10 when you learn the uh, Ricardian uh, theory of trade. Uh, we've learned a lot about trade since Ricardo wrote in the 19th century, but the basic lessons of the Ricardian theory of comparative advantage are the essence of why most policy wonks think uh, uh, trade is a, is a good idea. It expands the size of the economic pie. It's not zero sum. It means, means both trading partners uh, are better off. Uh, we talk about lot, that a lot in Act 10, and, and you, in your other economics courses, I'm sure you talk about that a lot as well. Uh, sadly, the American public is less convinced about that. And you see that reflected uh, all, in all sorts of places. You see it reflected in polls where people are, uh, are, are really not convinced uh, that, that, that trade agreements are a good thing. The, the public is very evenly split. And you see a lot of people who, in public life, are reflecting that. You see Lou Dobbs on TV every night uh, pounding the xenophobic drum about how we're exporting uh, America. Uh, well, he's, he, I, I, he's a smart enough man to know what his viewers want to hear. If that's what his viewers want to hear, that's what he's going to provide them. So I think he's really reflecting, not creating uh, that xenophobic uh, fear of, of trade, but reflect, reflecting it uh, in order to get ratings. You also see it in a variety of politicians. Uh, you see a tremendous amount of China bashing going on uh, uh, right now in Washington, really on, on both uh, sides of the aisle. Uh, the most egregious example in my mind is uh, Senator Schumer's proposal to put a 27% uh, tariff on all Chinese goods until China uh, revalues uh, its exchange rate. Um, I think you make a Good case that China should move to a floating exchange rate. A lot of economists have talked about floating exchange rates, but I think it's tremendously counterproductive to say that we're going to slap a tariff on their goods unless they agree with the exchange rate policy uh, uh, that we like. And I hope, Gene, as you advise the other senator from New York, as she runs for president, that you tell her not to adopt her, her uh, colleagues' uh, tra uh, trade uh, policies. Now, the basic question is, how are we going to move the free trade agenda forward? Uh, and I think, fundamentally, the solution is really one of economics education. Uh, I think people leaving Act 10 often are surprised that they're more in favor of free trade than they really expected to be uh, going in. And I think that's true of, sort of everyone who studies economics, that the, 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 certain, the logic of the Ricardian model of trade is very compelling once you understand it. Uh, but it's not an easy idea to understand at first. It takes some time. You have to sit down and study, study the graphs, study the diagrams. Paul Krugman has a wonderful essay called Ricardo's Difficult Idea. Uh, talks about why it's so hard for some people to understand the Ricardian model of trade. Uh, but it's, but it's something that can be done with basically a little bit of, of, of education. Um, I'm actually a believer that uh, no one should be studying principles of economics in college. The reason I say that is I think everyone should study it in high school. I think just as all voters should take a year of American history to be intelligent voters, to work in the voting booth and, uh, and know how to pull the lever, I think uh, uh, voters should study one year of economics in high school to understand the basics of supply and demand and comparative advantage. And I'm quite sure if we ever move to a system like that, Lou Dobbs, would all of a sudden change his mind about uh, the, the benefits of trade, and I'm sure Senator Schumer would as well, because they under, they're responding to market uh, forces. A rising inequality, so the next big challenge uh, uh, that I think we face. Income inequality has been rising. It's been rising roughly for 30 years. It started sometime in the mid-1970s, uh, and has ro been rising pretty continuously uh, since then. Uh, it's not the direct result of any particular public policy, because it's happening through Republican and Democratic administrations. And it probably has many causes. If you ask uh, the, the economists who study this, people like Larry Katz in our economics department, they'll tell you that about half of it is due to the increasing returns to skills as measured by, measured by education. Uh, the gap between a college and graduates and, and grad school graduates and people with, with only high school degrees has been growing over time. Uh, most people, uh, most economists who study this think it's largely technologically driven. The computer comes in and it means that very skilled workers who know how to use the computer uh, can be much more productive, and productivity is the ultimate determinant of wages. But it also means that the filing clerk uh, that we might have needed in the past becomes unnecessary. 
uh, because we can now do filing on, on the computer with, with, with fewer uh, workers. But there are also a variety of other uh, explanations for increasing inequality. Some of it might have to do with trade, although most people who study this think that's, that's not the major factor. Some of it also has to do with social forces. Uh, for, uh, for example, um, the, the changing role of women in society has contributed to rising inequality. Well, how is that? Well, two generations ago, if you were a, a, a Harvard male undergraduate, you graduated from Harvard College, became a corporate lawyer, made a lot of money, and you had a wife who stayed at home. Today, what do you do? You graduate from Harvard College, become a corporate lawyer, make a lot of money, and you marry another corporate lawyer who makes a lot of money. Uh, and so now you have two corporate lawyer salaries in the same household, and that increases inequality. Uh, we, see, we, see, we have seen an increase in what's called assortative mating. You all think of Harvard as an uh, educational institution. Well, it's also one of the most elite dating uh, services on the face of the planet. Uh, I uh, met my wife while well, she was a student here at Harvard College. Um, she was actually a student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, so it certainly helped, helped me in my assortative mating. Uh, I know Larry met his wife here. So there's, there is a, lo a lot of reasons to think that, um, that Harvard does more than just uh, help people accumulate uh, human capital. So there's lots of reasons why. <laughs> so, so look to your right and your left, and, and you may find your spouse right there. Um, uh, so, but so, so, so there's lots of reasons why uh, income inequality is going up, and the question is, what do we do about it as a society? And I don't think there's any a magic pill um, to deal with this. There's, there's some obvious things and some not obvious things. Um, one is we need to in in improve education and improve access to education. Uh, I'm a big believer in uh, vouchers. Uh, we have vouchers at the secondary level, things like Pell Grants. I think if we had more of a system of competitive uh, secondary schools, uh, that would be a good thing as well. Um, it's something that divides the two parties quite um, severely. Uh, but there's also the question of the social, social safety net. What kind of social safety net should we provide? I think there's a wide agreement that we, we have to provide a social safety net. But as soon as we start thinking about the social safety net, uh, we have to confront the, what Arthur Oaken called the big trade-off. And in a book uh, 40 years ago, the trade-off between equality uh, and efficiency. And that's, it is a very difficult trade-off because the, the more generous the social safety net is, the blunter our incentives and uh, the smaller the economic pie becomes. Uh, one of the great successes of the Clinton administration was the uh, 1996 welfare reform. Uh, but that, uh, surprisingly from, from a Democratic administration, actually moved the social safety net in a way to provide more incentives but a less generous uh, social safety net. And that was, by many people today, is widely considered uh, a success. Many European countries are now dealing with the issue of what should the social safety net be. Many, country, those, many continental European countries have unemployment insurance that goes on indefinitely, and not surprisingly, they have uh, much higher levels of long-term unemployment than the United States, where unemployment benefits are, are circumscribed. So that's an issue of how generous social safety net should be. It's something we need, a debate we need to all engage in, keeping in mind that social safety net is not a social free lunch, but involves efficiency uh, costs. Uh, the third topic I want to talk about is the uh, a budgetary uh, squeeze that's, that's looming on the horizon. There's widespread agreement among all policy wonks that the, the, the U.S. budget is on an unsustainable uh, path. And I'm not speaking specifically about this year's budget deficit or next year's budget deficit. I'm not all that worried about one or two years budget deficit, especially in time of war, war and recession are the two classic times when a lot of economists would say a budget deficit is a reasonable policy response. But if you look out over a year or two, over the 5, 10, 20, 30 year horizon, you see a path that, that looks uh, literally uh, incredible. And the basic problem is the aging of the population, uh, the impending um, retirement of the baby boom generation, as, and what's going to happen to the budget as we become eligible for Social Security and Medicare. And the central problem is the following. We have three baby boomers up here. And these three baby boomers, our generation, well, we've promised ourselves a lot of benefits. We've promised ourselves Social Security, we've promised ourselves Medicare, and we've promised that you're going to pay for it. And uh, the question is, how do you feel about that? Uh, under current levels of taxation, uh, it's not, it, those benefits are not going to be funded. And it's not just a matter of reversing the Bush tax cuts. Reversing the Bush tax cuts will be a drop in the bucket compared to the looming gap between future benefits and, um, and, and, and tax, tax revenues uh, as un, under current law. Uh, so the question is, what do we want to do about it? Do we want to move to levels of taxation similar to you see in uh, uh, Germany and uh, France, or do, we, or do we want to take a different path? So here are the big questions. The big questions are first, to what extent do we want to close this gap on the tax side? And to what extent do you want to close uh, this gap on the uh, spending side? You know, my guess, in, in the long run, you'll see a little bit of both. Actually, a lot of both, given how big the gap is. 
Uh, the question is, what's the relative proportion? Well, I personally would rather see more of it done on the spending side and less on the tax side. We could do it all on the tax side and, move and have taxation levels of France and Germany. It can be done, uh, but I think that would uh, have adverse effects on the economy. The extent we do it on the tax side, which taxes uh, should they be? I personally wouldn't reverse the Bush 2003 tax cuts. That's basically that would be raising taxes on corporate capital, and I think that's the most inefficient ways of raising revenue. I'd rather actually see increases in consumption taxes. I would even better like to see increases in good, what I call good taxes, what, what you and in Act 10 learn as Pagovian taxes, taxes that actually make the economy work more efficiently. For example, the gasoline tax or tax on carbon. Uh, about eight or nine years ago, I wrote an article advocating a, a 50 cent tax on gasoline. I've revised my views a little bit since then. I now go for a $1 tax on gasoline. But I think there's lots of reasons to think that the, uh, they're raising revenue through the gasoline tax rather than taxes on corporate capital would actually do good to the economy rather than uh, bad, uh, uh, having bad efficiency effects. And then there's a the question of if we're going to do it on the, on the spending side, how, how are we going to do it? How are we going to uh, reduce uh, promised benefits? Uh, there's a lot of different ways to do it. The president uh, and the Social Security reform proposed slowing the growth of benefits for uh, high income uh, Social Security beneficiaries is an idea that Robert Posen put forward uh, that, that, that didn't seem to have any traction in Congress, something we might, might come back to. My personal preference would be to uh, lower benefits by raising retirement ages. If you think about this, the elderly, this, you have to realize elderly is, is not one group. There's different kinds of elderly. There's the 85-year-old widow going to her and saying, I'm sorry, we're not going to give you Medicare. Seems kind of heartless and sort of politically uh, hard to imagine. To going to somebody who's 65 or 70 and saying, we'd like you to work a year or two longer because, because we don't want to burden your grandchildren with French-style tax levels seems to me uh, very, very, uh, very doable, uh, very just. It's not particularly politically popular. If you, uh, if you do polls and you give people a list, list of, of, of rankings of how to solve the entitlement problem, raising the retirement age is not coming very high. I think that's partly an issue of education. Among economists, it's quite popular. because I think, I think in part, just we've thought about these issues for a long time. Among the general public, they haven't really thought about what French-style uh, tax systems are gonna, will, will do to their grandchildren. Uh, all the alternatives on the spending side is taking Medicare away from the 85-year-old uh, widow. So I think raising the retirement age is probably will, will be one of, part of the solution, together with probably some um, uh, uh, re uh, revenue raisers. So those are, I think, the challenges uh, facing your generation, um, dealing with the issue of uh, globalization and trying to convince the world that it's, it's not as scary as, uh, as, as they fear and that the policy monks may be right. Uh, deal, figuring out what the right social safety net is for dealing with rising inequality and figuring out how to solve the uh, long-term uh, budgetary squeeze. Um, let me just sort of kind of, let me take, take one comment on something Gene said about, sort of, the, about the safety net, in particular as it applies to trade. One of the big issues becomes of trade and how you deal with the losers from trade. And I think Gene and I agree that trade expands the size of the economic pie and creates winners and losers. That, I think, is, is, is something agreed, agreed upon. The question, then, is how do you deal with the losers from trade, say, the textile worker in, in South Carolina? Well, we have a general social safety net. We have things like unemployment insurance. We have a welfare system. We have earned income tax credit if he has to take taking a low-wage job. So we have a general social safety net. The issue for trade, then, becomes does a person who loses their job to trade deserve a better social safety net, a different social safety net, a stronger social safety net than the person who loses their job due to change in technology or for some other reason. My own sense is there's no ethical case for, for saying the, that there should be a different social safety net. There should be a general social safety net for everyone, and you should, you should have the same social safety net regardless of why you lose your job. But there is a, another argument for the trade adjustment assistance, which is that those, those, those workers may block free trade unless they get extra, an extra social safety net. So I think the case really for trade adjustment assistance, which does come up fairly regularly in Washington, isn't so much an ethical case that these guys really deserve a better social safety net than everyone else. It's really that, gosh, these guys have the ability to block, and it's a political reality. They've got to, they've got to buy them off with, 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 with extra payments that other, other people wouldn't get if they lost their job for some other reason. So I'm, I'm perfect. I, trade adjustment assistance is one of those issues I think Gene and I might disagree on. I don't know. Maybe Gene will have, a, have an opinion about that. Let me stop there and hear what uh, President Summers in the audience has to say. Thank you very much, Craig. Um, let me ask a question and invite both of you to give a response. But because I'm going to ask a political kind of question, I'm going to ask you to keep your answers to one minute. 
uh, to the question, because I think it points up the difficulty of uh, these issues, and I'll stylize this a bit. We have a seminar each year for new mayors at the Kennedy School. And the mayor of uh, a city in Michigan came to that seminar, and he heard me give uh, a speech that had some of the same elements that, of the, what the two of you have said. And he said, look, in my city, three major factories that employ 20% of the people have closed in the last four years. There are a lot more exports of uh, there are a lot more exports of cars and car parts coming from Mexico, Japan, China, and the South because those factories have closed. We had a great thing going uh, in terms of people doing computer programming, and the children of a lot of those people in that factory were doing a lot of computer uh, work, but those jobs have just moved uh, to India because there's because the economy is doing much less well and house prices have uh, fallen. We've got 20% less in our municipal budget. The police force is smaller. There's more crime. We're no longer able to pay coaches to do sports uh, in uh, the schools. And we've stopped teaching advanced placement calculus because we can't afford it anymore to give people a chance. That's your globalization. I'm supposed to give my inaugural address. What should I say to give people hope? <laughs> That's the political reality out there. That's what these guys are. That's what that's what the political class is. Fate is Senator Graham's nodding <laughs> nodding his head uh, here. That's what the political class out there is facing. And you know maybe the answer is put back in an economics course into the high school, and then everybody will understand that it's okay. Um, <laughs> but um, there you are. There you are. You're talking to a group of regular people, and just I'd like each of you to tell me what you'd say. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm, I, there's good reasons why I'm not a politician, um, but but you know, the, the issues arise not only for uh, trade and globalization; they arise for technology. What I mean, if he had said you know, 100 years ago, he said, you know, they used to have these really great horse-drawn buggies made in my town, and damn it, you know, half a, half a, half a country away they opened up a car factory, and now nobody wants our horse-drawn buggies anymore. What do we do? Or the Luddites in England in the early 19th century saying, you know. I'm, I used to be a great skilled knitter, and then they open up these damn looms, and I'm out of work because nobody wants hand-knitted sweaters anymore. They want these cheaper hand-knitted looms. So all, so this, you know, whenever there's what Schumpeter called creative destruction, there are, there are going to be uh, losers, and that's, it, there's no question. That, is, that was painful for the Luddites. They really did suffer. They weren't, they, their pain wasn't imagined. That was the guys who made this, the, the horse and buggies. They really did suffer. Uh, but the solution is clearly not to say, we should got to stop the car, we got to stop those looms. Okay, so it's, that's kind of the solution. Now, the, I don't know what the mayor should say, but I know what the, the people should do. The people should probably move. And we have this basic problem, which is that, that politicians are place-based. I mean, Ed Glazer's written a lot on this. Our, 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 our policy should be based on people, not on places. We shouldn't work on, reach, on, on, on getting places back up. We should get, we get, we get people to, to the jobs, and people Get pe bring people up. We saw the same thing happening in, within reconstruction of, uh, in, of New Orleans. There's a tremendous emphasis, I think, on New Orleans as a place as opposed to the people. And for many people, moving may well be the best way to, to prosperity. I mean, s I mean certainly, I mean, a lot of people here are the children and grandchildren of immigrants. And my, my, uh, uh, my grandparents came from Ukraine where they were very poor. W w should they have figured out some way to survive in Ukraine, or should they have come to the United States? Well, coming to the United States worked out pretty well for them. And I think my guess is a lot of the people in there... Where do you think the people in Flint should go? I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a... I'm not a... Per I mean, if they should leave, well, well, where should well, they go? We, we could pick out a map and figure out where, where, the, where the unemployment rates are low, where unemployment where areas are growing, in particular for, for those kind of workers. I mean, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have a specific place for you, uh, but, but I think it's... What's, but I think... I, I'm, one of the things we know about so the study of, of, of regional dynamics is part of the, a large part of regional dynamics is moving. Gee, <clears throat> how would you answer the question? Well, um, let, let me, uh, I, I, I'll, give you my best, I'll give you my best shot at it. But, but let me say 
there are a lot of things Greg and I, I think, see alike, but I guess in some ways when I listen to Greg's description, it's a little bit, I have to say, too much in what I would call the don't worry, be happy camp. And what I mean more on that is that it's talking to people more in kind of longer macro trends. You can read David Elwood's study about the declining or the stagnant workforce, and you can make a pretty good argument that 20 years from now, there'll be hundreds of millions of more middle class Chinese and Indian consumers, and we'll have a smaller workforce. And you know, 20 years from now, the future looks you know, pretty good. Now, my guess is, for some of you, that if I told you that your particular job skills right now look pretty dismal for the next four or five years, but I have a feeling it looks better seven or eight years from now, you probably wouldn't go home and be high-fiving people over that you would probably find that pretty depressing. And I think that the fact, is, the fact is, is that if you're governing, if you're looking at the economy, you are dealing with people and places. And I think one of the things that, uh, you know, if there's kind of a, I don't know if it's mea culpa a little bit in my book, it is that I, that I think we talk too much like the way Greg was talking now. Because the fact is, yes, you can say that if you lose 1,000 jobs in one place and you create 1,000 jobs by creating 10 in 100 places, that it all evens out. But the fact is, is that for those particular communities, they do go on a horrible downward spiral. And those people are suffering very deeply, and it's very difficult for the communities to get out. And, and simply saying, you know, everybody move at the last moment. The fact is we have kind of a broken system a bit where people come and often the only choices are, are you for uh, protection or letting the community get devastated? And, and I think that, that we have to try to offer some better solutions. I think we should try to be doing a little bit more in advance to, to see communities that are in trouble and help people diversify more. I don't think all the adjustment is, I don't, I agree with you on one thing, I'm for expanding adjustment systems generally. I don't believe in linking it to trade at all. But I'm not sure I, I, I think it should be linked just to after you've lost a job. I think we should give people more ability to transition, more things for community transition. But I think it's a mistake, I guess, it's going to Larry's point or what I think it implies, is that to talk about, to criticize just Chuck Schumer, and you, know, you can find lots of demagoguery in trade and globalization, but you look at the faces of the steel workers who came to protest us, there's no demagoguery there. there. There are people who are deeply suffering, who are worried for their lives, who are worried for their community, who feel like America's kind of broken their promise to them. And I think to just kind of say, well, if everybody just understands the macroeconomics, things will be fine really misses a lot. And I think if we take that attitude, people will rebel against trade, not because they're uneducated, but they're reflecting their personal experience as they feel it. Now, adjustment assistance is not sexy. As I've said before, it's the, you know, as I said, it's the prenup of public policy. It's what we're going to do for you after something bad happens to you in your life. Nobody wants to hear it. But the fact is there are ways to do things that don't move you towards European style. Wage insurance is linked to finding a job. It, you can't be accused of being necessarily anti-efficiency. If you only get a benefit trigger to going to work, that's a way we could have a bit more humanity, uh, limit the size of falls for people. Um, so I, you know, I, I guess I, I, I don't want to, I, I want to associate myself with your larger points on the benefits of globalization, but I think it's a real mistake to trivialize as political or uneducated how much the harm is, how much the anxiety is. The studies that Hacker and Farber are showing are showing that when people are, that people who are losing jobs are sometimes, are now averaging, I shouldn't say people losing jobs, people losing jobs who take a loss. The loss is deeper, 20 to 40 percent now. That's a real reason for people to feel greater anxiety about the, 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 the degree of their fall. Now I'm going to go ahead and try to do Larry's speech. I think what I would say if I were a politician there is I would, I would let people know that I was doing everything I could every single day to fight to save those jobs. I would, um, I think the sad part is there's very little mayors and governors can often do. I think to the degree we need improvements, we probably do need them more at the federal policy levels. Governor Granholm can't take the legacy cost off GM alone. She can't change the health care uh, costs that go on employers alone. Those are more national policy issues, whatever the right answer is. But I think what I would say is, I would say, 
uh, where I would come down at the end is I would say, we're going to do all these things. We're going to fight. We're going to look for every different way we can do tax incentives, anything cajoling to try to keep the jobs here. But in the end, I would say that ultimately, this city uh, has got to win from the future. And, and, and I would say, I'm not going to tell you that we can protect every job or save every job. And I would have a plan for what, uh, what you're going to do uh, for the future. And I think it's very difficult for a politician because you know, Tom Friedman has this great line in his book where he talks about somebody from India saying to him, it's easy to live in India. He said, you know what you do every day when you wake up in the morning. You want to do what your, the United States is doing. If you live in India and China, you know what you're trying to do today and tomorrow. You're trying to do what the United States is doing. If you're in the United States, you don't know what the future is. And so that's, that's, that, that creates a difficulty because we can't point automatically to what jobs replace the Delphi jobs. But I think that ultimately, I do think politicians, and I think Bill Clinton did this, was to try to show, I'm working for you every day, I feel your pain, but then tell the hard story about the future that you've got to adjust, but do it with a plan of action and not just, uh, you know, not just your textbook. Can I, can I respond to that? Very quickly, because okay. then I want to go to I, the floor. I don't, I don't, I'm perfectly happy to have politicians feel their pain. That's the politician's job, not the, not the economics professors. Ours is to tell the facts, so that's why I didn't feel the pain. But on the, on the, uh, on, on the substance, I don't think subsidies are very, very different. I don't think I'd go with the tax subsidies to, to, keep, to keep the jobs there, because my guess is they would, in, in the end, work very well, or they'd be very expensive. I'm kind of nervous about creating more entitlements until we figure out ways to pay for the entitlements that we've already promised people. So I think that's maybe where Gene and I would disagree on, on sort of the, the, the benefits of expanded government programs. But maybe I should stop, leave it at that. Floor is open for questions. There are four mics, one here, one there, and two up above. Yes, sir. Uh, Questions, not speech. Questions, not speeches, and no multi-part questions. Go right ahead. Question for Mr. Mankiw. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, uh, we've, we've been talking about uh, sort of uh, the comparative advantage issue, and uh, comparative advantage is somewhat of a static theory. So as things as things develop, a new comparative advantage needs to, need to be developed. So I'm curious, where will the new comparative advantage in the United States? Where will they come from, considering the fact that higher education institutions in other countries are uh, continually improving, more and more people who are coming to the United States to get an education are moving back to the country they came from, and more and more visas are denied to international students because of anti-terrorist issues? I mean, you're right that the uh, comparative advantages we teach at NEC 10 is a static theory. But go take on, more, take on more advanced trade courses and you'll see dynamic theories of comparative advantage, how comparative advantage evolves over time. And there'll be lots of different things that will provide um, a source of comparative advantage in the United States. You mentioned that students come here, get educated, and go back home. What does that tell you? We have a comparative advantage in producing human capital. And indeed, human capital is an export industry. You come here, you buy degrees from Harvard University. We're an, ex we're an exporter. And I'm sure there are a lot of students here that are customers uh, from other countries. Uh, and we, we thank you for contributing to our, to our trade surplus in higher education. Uh, hi there, yes. Um, my question is uh, pretty short. Um, what, in your opinions, um, whoever is interested in taking the question, would, be the, um, would really be the cost of solving the problem of global world poverty? <laughs> I'll, um, I, th there's, one air, well, there's one piece of that I, I'm, I'm somewhat informed on, so let me let me answer that since it's uh, close to my heart. The other thing I do in life is I run the uh, Center for Universal Education. Um, uh, this is an issue that is also very close to Larry Summers' heart, who gave what was really the, the, maybe the initial visionary speech on the importance of girls' education around the world when he was uh, chief economist at, at, the, at the World Bank. Um, and so I do that, and I also run the Global Campaign for Education. There, uh, I think that when you look uh, at the 100 plus million children who are out of school and, and you look at what it would mean to basically have a quality basic education and you look at what you could reasonably expect from the developing countries themselves, I think we globally would need to spend an additional about 10 billion a year. If the US 
were to do its traditional share, when you look at debt relief or other IMF things, we usually take on 25% to a third. So I think that is an area where the United States could take an enormous progress uh, and I think would do enormous good for global poverty, for hope, for opportunity, for women, female empo em empowerment. I also think that it would do a hell of a lot for our image uh, around the world. And I can tell you, uh, if you had jobs like Greg and I did, you see a whole lot of bad things that two or three billion dollars get spent on. Grease for bad deals uh, that, that uh, go through. When you think of what a few billion dollars could do for us looking like we were championing every girl uh, in Africa, around the world, having a chance to basic education. That is one very tangible thing that we could play a very major role in. We should do it with tough love. We shouldn't give money unless there's accountability and transparency. But we should create that commitment to inspire the ministers of finance and ministers of education in these countries to believe that if they do that, that the world will be there to support them. You said one sentence on that. The event in human history, I believe, that has brought more people out of poverty is growth in China in the past 10 years. China is a big country, it's a poor country, and it's growing very fast. And while inequality in the United States may be rising, inequality around the world is shrinking, as this has been established by economist Xavier Salah E. Martin, because of rapid growth in China and to some extent India. So that really does put the China bashers in a particular light of being basically people who are fighting the force that's bringing more people out of poverty than anything in human history. Yes. Hi, uh, my name's Noah Sawyer, I'm a Kennedy School student, and my question is about the environment. Uh, you talked about it briefly, Dr. Mankiw, but um, one, do you see uh, environmental, especially global warming, as a barrier to growth? And are there policies the U.S. can put into place that enable growth to continue with, uh, while also protecting against global warming and other environmental crises in the future? I'm, not, I'm far from an expert on, on, on global warming. I'm actually sim somewhat sympathetic, as I've written in the past, to having a, a carbon tax. When I talk about good taxes, a gasoline tax, a carbon tax, I think would probably be the natural way to, to think about it. I think it's actually more workable than, the, than Kyoto, which is a bit of a mess. Uh, but I think a, you know, a, a global carbon tax would, sort of, would make a lot of sense. Hi, I'm Julia, and I am um, a freshman in Larry Summers' Globalization Seminar. Um, and he recently got us to read William Eastley's book, which showed that increases in spending on education in many third world countries make absolutely no dent on GDP growth whatsoever. Because um, in many third world countries um, in which corruption is pervasive, the biggest incentives for educated people are for people to lobby the government to you know, try to um, become wealthy, not through becoming more productive, but through you know, gaining access to political patronage. And um, he suggests that the only way we can in, you know, sort of influence growth at all is by changing the incentives and institutions in those countries. Um, I'd like to offer that as a rebuttal to your point on education. Swirling. Well, you know, I said this before and I spoke You at, can see what my seminar's like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and I, don't, I mean this more towards pre press or easterly than, than to you. I think the kind of studies where people say, if you spend a certain amount, that's the only variable you look at, do things get better in and of themselves? And they find no. I always feel whenever I hear that, like I want to say, duh. Um, in other words, you know, yes, if you're balancing out giving money to a Honduras or a Cambodia or others who are doing some of the right things, or Kenya right now, who's tried to eliminate fees and move out of a very corrupt regime. They're still struggling with that, doing more. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, that money there, well spent, makes a huge difference. If you're giving it to corrupt regimes, if you look at long-term averages. So if the notion is we shouldn't just think that you give money, that's an answer, I agree. But that's just, you know, to me, what I would hope people would spend their time thinking about is under what circumstances and what arrangements do greater resource matter? Because don't tell me resources don't matter in education. Education is resource intensive. Kenya went from 5.9 million to 7.6 million kids by eliminating fees. If you have 1.7 million kids come in, your class sizes are going to explode unless you have resources for education. I went to a class, a school in Tanzania, where money had gone to the upper primary school, but not the lower primary school. 
The upper primary school was painted. There were 35, 40 kids in the school. The second grade class there had 140 kids, 140 for one teacher, and most of them are sitting on, on the, the floor. I took a picture of both of those classes so I could say to them, so I could say to people, are you telling me resources don't make a difference? I think what you want to do is you want to have kind of the debt relief type of model. You have a, a, a certainty of resources if you're doing the right things. What you don't want to do is just give resources. You're right, that just hurts credibility and allows people like Easterly to try to deny the whole profession, the whole idea of doing more. But I think that the one thing you should remember in education is that it is a very difficult thing when leaders in developing countries go forward. They're helping the economy of their successor successor. We're a country that doesn't have universal preschool. That's how great we are. Uh, they're, so the poor country, they're going to get first and second graders, number one. Second, the major cost is teachers, which is a recurrent cost that goes on, while the funding they get from the World Bank and others tends to be two or three years. So in other words, what we should do is create incentives for good guys to go forward. You should have tough love, and that's the way we should do it. So I, I guess my feeling is what we should be figuring out is what are the right circumstances and the right incentive structure that helps get more kids in school. Because you know, I just think 100 million children between 6 and 11 not going to school, you know, I guess I'm just not willing to say we'll just wait for 20, 30, 40 years and that many childhoods before we try to figure out what might work. Hello, my name is Jacobo Garcia. I'm a student here in the Kennedy School. Um, my question is, from a poorly economic standpoint, what should be the policy goals of a potential immigration reform? I'm sorry, from a... Question, immigration, immigration reform from a pure economic standpoint. I, I, I keep promising seconds. myself that I need to get more up on things. I'll tell you, let me just tell you one observation, which I, I did work a lot on the H-1B extension. I, I do think it's worth taking a look at H-1B because it is such a broad category and the people who come in are tied to a single company. And all the justifications for it are the most talented folks. But most of the people come through make $40,000. I think you probably want a, quite a lot of immigration for people who are at a very, very high skill level, who want to stay. And I wouldn't make them like an indentured servant tied to one company. On the other hand, I'm not so sure I'd be as open in making it so easy to fill 40, 50, 60 thousand dollar jobs, because I think in a lot of those jobs, the companies are really just defining it's a little easier to just do that rather than get involved in the more difficult thing of retraining and looking for workers around here. So that's, that's an observation. I, I see no reason not to let a skilled worker come in. A skilled worker comes in, contributes tax revenue here uh, to, the, to the US government. If any, if it, to the extent it changes the wage structure, it does it in a way to increase equality because it's increasing the supply of skilled workers, so it's driving down the skill premium that we I talked about earlier. So it's hard to see what the, why it was any restrictions on skilled workers. On unskilled workers, again, they come in, if they're working, they contribute some, tax, some taxes, uh, they contribute to society, but they may well ca cause inequality to rise. And then we have a difficult question. Are, to protect the poor, here in the United States, are we going to protect, are we going to stop other unskilled workers to come in because of they, they might depress the wages of our unskilled workers? Do, doing that basically may benefit our, the unskilled workers in the United States by hurting the unskilled worker at the border who's, who's ready to come in and work. Uh, ethically, it's a very hard case to make, but that is essentially the anti-immigration case, I think. Hi. My name is Linda Adamson. I'm a first year here at the Kennedy School and just finished taking markets and market failures, so learning about all the principles of economics, and I actually took it with cases. So I learned about, as well, the long-term implications that come with that. And I found these cases very valuable. Now, you've both made allusions to the, to the fact that we, um, we need to be addressing and developing policies that are more broad-scaled and that don't just affect people that have just suffered from a disaster or are suffering in, in one particular area. I was wondering if you could both give us an example of a case that you found to be particularly compelling of a policy that has reached across a broad range of people. 
And having spent a lot of time abroad and thinking that we have a lot of lessons to learn, particularly from some place like France, I would um, be very open to hearing an example of something from an international, uh, an international approach. Thank you. I, I, I apologize. I'm not totally sure. I, I want to make sure I answer your question right. Can, can you? Successful, inter a successful, a successful broad-gauged policy, uh, particularly if it's an international example. Broad page. Well, let me talk. No, not I, necessarily trade adjustments. Simply that we maybe don't want to just address, you know, the people that have been hurt with the hurricane. We want to develop right. a policy well, let me, that doesn't. You know, as I said, Greg and I may differ. I mean, I think kind of, you know, Greg is lamenting the fiscal policies. Um, let me get, give you a, a fact. We can get into this later. I went and just decided to add up how much the tax cuts and the prescription drugs were. Nothing else, just tax cuts and prescription drugs. How much it cost in 2011 alone. So for the next decade, how much will those policies, not Iraq, terrorism, those policies cost in a single year? $408 billion. $408 billion in a single year. Three times, four times as much as you would have needed to make Social Security solvent. So when I kind of, we're talking about trying to make people feel better in the global economy, and you say a wage insurance program is five or $10 billion, is that gonna be too expensive? What can we do? Look, that's just a value choice. We decided it was worth spending 400 billion a year on tax cuts and, not, and doing a prescription drug plan that was not offset or paid for, as opposed to broadening out some of these policies. Now the reason why trade adjustment policies and the policies you do end up being so narrow is because everybody has a great idea and they, and they keep narrowing the criteria to keep the cost low. So what happens is there aren't 500 people in the United States who know when they lose a job, other than unemployment insurance, what they're eligible for. There aren't 500 people in Washington who know the difference between dislocated work uh, program and the trade adjustment assistance. So I do think this is an area uh, where we should expand. And, and here's successful. I think the typical, you know, the typical American can go into any city and know where to get a pizza, where to go to Blockbuster, uh, and the typical middle class family, at least, has a pretty good sense of what they need to do to borrow for college. It's fairly universal. It's not understood as much in low income families, but people have a pretty broad sense how to do it, where you go, et cetera. I think if you want to do something about the degree of worker anxiety, you've got to have simple, broad based policies. So the high school, person with a high school degree loses his uh, job or suffers a dislocation, they can call one number and have one place that they go. And I think that, you know, I know people will feel that's an expansion of government to have health care in between jobs and wage insurance and to have it in a more simple place to do. But I think, you know, if you can do one-stop shopping for at Target, we should be trying to work towards that. And I think if we don't, that all these little adjustments in trade adjustment assistance won't matter much because nobody knows what they mean. Nobody knows if they're eligible. Nobody knows. And so they don't do much. So I would say college loans, Pell Grants, there's broad understanding of that. If we could get adjustment assistance to that level, both in being broad, and I agree with Greg, not applied whether it's trade or technology, uh, and then make it as simple as easy. I think that is the place we need to go eventually because the economy is gonna stay as volatile and dynamic as it is right now in the future, and we do way, way too little to help people in between jobs. I'm gonna take the liberty, because Gene was modest, of giving you a different answer to your question. And it's a question that uh, gives credit to several people in this room. The, one of the most important revolutions in American policy that's taken place in the last 20 years, and it's taken place with very little commentary, is what we, we as a country now do for the working poor. We used to do nothing for the working poor. We used to do a ton for the non-working poor. And now, as David Elwood has documented, we do 10 times as much as we did in the late 1980s for the working poor. And a very important part of the reason for that is because David Elwood wrote a book uh, about welfare 
that had as one of its central themes making work pay that a guy named Bill Clinton carried around for two years during his campaign. And there's another reason why uh, we are doing much more for the poor, and it's an example of the kind of um, broad-based uh, policy that you're talking about, and it's the kind of story that should be an inspiration uh, to people uh, in uh, this room, and it's about Gene, and it's about the beginning of the Clinton administration. At the beginning of the Clinton administration, we this, there was this, the president decided he was going to have a major deficit reduction bill and that he was going to raise taxes on the highest income people, but that he was going to do some uh, important things. And there were endless meetings. And at these meetings, you know, there was Lloyd Benson sitting there, and there was Bob Rubin sitting there, and there was the president uh, sitting there. And frankly, each one of them was wearing a suit that cost more than all the clothes Gene had uh, in his wardrobe. Um, but at each, one of, at each one of those meetings, Gene would talk about the EITC. And eventually, everybody learned what EITC stood for. It stood for Earned Income Tax Credit, which was a policy that had begun under President Reagan's uh, uh, time. The basic idea of which was that if you were part of the working poor, you should get your social security tax rebated, and you should get some extra help as well. And so a situation should be created where if you earned an extra dollar, not only did you not get taxed, but you got some extra money from the government. And basically, because Gene wouldn't stop raising the, raising the issue, and it was easier to put Gene's thing into the package than it was to have Gene explain again why it needed to be put uh, in the package. And because Gene uh, persevered, we committed as a country, I don't know what the number is, another five to ten billion dollars a year to uh, the working poor. And there are a whole set of people who are making $12,000 a year who are getting an extra $500 or $1,000 uh, in the budget because Gene was uh, in the government, and he pushed, and he persevered. And that was an example of making work pay, helping, wealth, uh, helping uh, poor people, and is the kind of example that we should be looking for uh, in uh, a lot more context. And Gene, if there are any inaccuracies in that story, please correct me afterwards. <laughs> We've got time for two more questions. Yes. Hi, my name is Jason Miller. I'm a second year at the uh, Kennedy School here. My question is for Professor Mankey, but i also like to hear Mr. Sperling's response. As one of the many lucky students here that gets to bear the burden of all of the choices today, how do all of the various tax cuts and the extension of the Bush tax cut, repeal of the estate tax, lowering dividend and capital gains taxes make any sense? I mean, as I said, you know, part, when we think about this, closing this budget gap going forward, the revenue side may well be part of it. The question then, of course, is how, what, what, what sort uh, of taxes do you want? I have particular preferences on taxes. I think a broad-based consumption tax, I mean, I, if we can't do the good taxes, like gasoline taxes, at least a broad-based consumption tax, I think, is the least distortionary tax. I personally, since you mentioned the estate tax, let me sort of give you my, 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 uh, my two-minute, well, half a minute spiel as to why I, I think a true pill estate tax personally makes sense. From an efficiency standpoint, it's a tax on capital, and I think taxes on capital retard economic growth. But even from an, an equity standpoint, you get two people, make the same amount of money. One says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend it on myself. The other says, I'm gonna live a modest middle class lifestyle and leave it to my kids. Why should the second person pay more, a higher tax than the first person? Why should a person, two people make the same amount of money, why should the person who spend it on himself have lower taxes? That doesn't seem equitable from, uh, from my standpoint. I gotta calm myself down on that one. Um, <laughs> first of all, generally in life, one thing Bill Clinton used to say, if you know, you're in a hole, stop digging. Um, and it's very hard for me to hear about how we have revenue problems, et cetera. I just mentioned 400 billion a year in perpetuity. It's, a, it's remarkable how, do, how much of a setback. It's very hard for me to hear to hear somebody talk about the sacrifice, the savings that you need to do uh, when you've already made 
when you've already taken three steps backwards, I mean, think about it. The amount of resources we would have needed to fix Social Security, 75 years, that amount, we've already committed about three or four times as much. So the problem in terms of our national resources we need to devote is three or four times worse today. So to me, it, it is just absolutely uh, inexcusable. You know, it's funny, I just did a presentation to members of Congress today, and I said what it means to be called a tax increaser right now. And I went through all the things that almost everybody is for, extending the 10% tax bracket, extending the 20, 15% bracket, doing all those things. And it, you know, it was incredible. This is, it came to about two and a half trillion over the next 10 years. So then the question really, then the debate comes down to is, should we spend that extra one and a half trillion over the next 10 years on Social Security or Medicare or taking on some of these great pro challenges, doing more so we're not cutting NIH at this critical time or not having all children go to preschool. I mean, to me, this is, the, uh, uh, this is a fairly simple value trade-off that you would make. And on the estate tax, I mean, first of all, $137 billion will go in the next 10 years, each and every year, to people who make over $200,000. $137 billion each and every year. On the estate tax, if you look at just the top 700 families, when you repeal the estate tax, the top 700 families get about $15 billion. It's amazing. $20 million apiece. This is, to me, the most obscene policy I've ever seen. And I have to say honestly, I don't care that much about the equity among people making with you know, 500, a billion dollar estates. You could have, right now, you could get an agreement unanimous, the president wanted to, that said $5 million per couple, leave to your family, never pay a penny of taxes. If you did that, you could save four to 500 billion dollars over the next 10 years. Uh, I think it's, it was really obscene to think about giving such a huge amount to so few people. And let me tell you why the tax cuts are even more expensive than we've described. Because they have blocked any sense of mutual sacrifice or bipartisan compromise. What happens is, is that you, as long as you're giving a trillion dollars away to people who are well off, the president doesn't have any moral authority to ask middle class families to have a higher retirement age or to take a little less on their Medicare. So it's more expensive. It is the thing that blocks the moral authority for a bipartisan compromise. And I think that, <laughs> and if I seem partisan, I want you to know that the, the Republican front runner for, uh, for 2008, John McCain, voted against both tax cuts for almost exactly the reasons I've mentioned. Now, I've always said that I, if I were President Bush, I would say I would repeal the tax cut on those over 200,000, if I were him, only if Democrats came to the table and were part of an entitlement solution. The key thing for difficult choices is it's not about numbers, it's about political cover. And you have to be willing as a president to put your difficult priorities on the table to get the other side to come forward. Now, Greg is in a different league because Greg talks, Greg does not talk about no pain. He talks about gas tax. He talks about a carbon tax. When you can do that, you can start having a bipartisan discussion. And I think that there are great things we could be doing on energy, great things on fiscal discipline, great things on social security. But I'm telling you, I do not know how somebody goes and says we can afford $75 billion a year next decade to repeal the estate tax and then turn around and explain to somebody making $60,000 a year why they're going to have to work two years longer. You can't do both at the same time. When we get that kind of, whether it's a Democrat or Republican, they've got to show they're willing to compromise on their priorities to get the other side to come to the table. And that is the only way we're going to do anything really big and bold in this country in the next 10 years. Greg, do you, want, do you want to respond or do you want to go to the next question? No, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to respond. I mean, I, as I said, I agree that debt you know, compromise will probably involve uh, tax increases. The question is whether it's going to be the tax increases of precisely the sort that you want. Um, I'm, I'm, perfectly, I'm perfectly happy with a broad-based consumption tax, and, and, you're a, and your person who's receiving your estate will not paying that when they consume that estate. 
The question is whether, whether you want to have a tax system that tells people, you made a lot of money, make sure you spend it before you die. Okay, and that's essentially tax, that's what an estate tax is. It basically tells people to, to spend their money now and not save it. And I don't quite see the, 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 lo the logic in that. Let's take one more question. I'm, I'm Leslie Gerwin. I'm a mid-career student here at the Kennedy School. I'd like to follow up on uh, Professor Mankiw's your comment on New Orleans as uh, people over places. And I was just wondering, um, and maybe uh, Professor Sperling, Ms. Sperling, you'll comment on it as well, as to uh, what would be, from an economist's point of view, an appropriate federal government response to what the, the challenges we're facing with rebuilding New Orleans? Well, that, that, is, that is well beyond my ken. And actually, I would, I would encourage you to go read uh, my colleague, Ed Glazier, who wrote a very nice article in a, in a publication called The Economist's Voice about precisely that, that question. And so what I was mimicking, basically, was Ed's uh, point of view. And, and, and his basic message is that um, aid, sh and this is not just in New Orleans, but sort of ge generally, he's made this point in other contexts as well, aid should be person-based and not place-based. Because it's the people we want to help. We don't want to make commitment to places. You might wonder why it is we have so much place-based policies, things like enterprise zones and so on. Well, it's because we have politicians that are place-based. If, if, if somebody gets better off by moving out of their district, that doesn't help a congressman who wants to get reelected because they're now in somebody else's district. So the basic problem is we have place-based politicians who end up with place-based policies, even if person-based policies are, in some sense, what we should be aiming for. Gene? You know, I, I just find, I find that view just far too abstract for me. Uh, people actually do live in places and they do move, but communities have lives and histories and they should have to adjust with times. But when you have what is, I think, a horrible failure of policy over probably several administrations in preventing what happened there and a horrible uh, incompetence in dealing with it, I think, it's, I, I think it, is, uh, it, it, it is, you know, for me, not acceptable to say that, uh, uh, that your only options are to take a housing voucher and move somewhere else. I, th I think there's a responsibility to try to make the homes and the places people have to give that an option. And right now, and that's, and that's the difference, is that generally you're saying you should give people choices to move other places. This is a rare case. This is whether we give people an option to stay in the home and the community that they had that was hurt not by the winds of economic change, but by natural disaster and policy failure. Well, I would encourage people to do a calculation. Find out how much you're spending on rebuilding New Orleans, divide by the number of people who lived in New Orleans, and ask how many people would rather take that money lump sum rather than the, actually the way we're, we're, we're implementing it. And I think you'd, you'd find that okay, that's, a, that's a big sum of money on a per person basis. Let me. Uh... We're just about at the end, but uh, it is, I gather, the custom of the forum to allow each speaker a very brief uh, final statement in the reverse order with which uh, they began. So, Professor Mankiw. Well, I will be very brief. Thank you for all your questions, and thank you for, uh, for, for coming uh, to listen to us. I think Gene and I agree on a lot of things. Actually, my guess is 90% of the things we agree on. I think the 10% has to do with how, how much we expect government can do in terms of improving people's lives. Uh, Adam Smith once said that uh, little is required to, for a state to go from barbarism to opulence, but peace, easy taxes, and a tolerable administration of justice. And I think uh, if you agree, so agree with that, you, you want it ends up being fairly conservative. But I think, I think Gene wants to go beyond peace, easy taxes, and toler tolerable administration of justice, wants a more activist government. And I can understand the case for that. Uh, but to me, it does seem like the uh, triumph of hope uh, over experience. It's embarrassingly short. <laughs> the short one I was going to say now. Greg. You didn't use your two minutes. Um, well, you know, I, I guess I, I wanted to, to, to um, say two things in the end, which is that one, I really do think that it is important that we see the budget issues that we face as the value choices they are. Uh, I have a little fable I say in Washington that's become pretty popular among some circles about the uh, father who goes out and leases three fully loaded Hummers and finds himself paying 10,000 extra in leases per year. 
and uh, soon the family's in starting to face some hardship. So he calls them together around the dinner table and he holds up and he says, a 32 ounce jar of uh, whole food crunchy peanut butter. And he says, you know, we're spending $4 on this. We could be getting the Skippy for $2. And the uh, teenage son, of course, says, but like dad, man, you're spending 10,000 on like cars we don't need. Why are you busting us over $2 on peanut butter? And uh, the father replies, do not change the subject. We are talking about peanut butter. <laughs> now what happens right now in the administration is the $400 billion a year is over there. It's behind the curtain. It's the Hummer we can't talk about. And so you can't talk about something like the estate tax in the abstract. You know, I think it might be nice not to have lots of things. Uh, but the fact is, is that you're making a choice. And when you worry about the equities of people making 200 or with three or 400 million dollar estates, which by the way, when you repeal the estate tax, ends up hurting charitable giving enormously. But when you make that choice, it's not an abstract discussion. You're making a value choice about what you decided to do with that versus what you decided to do about child poverty, about the earned income tax credit, about global poverty issues. And you know, you can learn a lot about the appropriations, you can learn a lot about all the different budget things, but take it from me, I did eight years of, of, of the White House budgets. You look and the money is fungible and it is a value choice that you make. And I think we're making some terrible, terrible value choices now. And I think we need to really look hard. Uh, and I'm really hopeful that no matter what happens in 2008, we have people who come in and look at these tough problems. Because I think the easiest thing to do is to stay lodged in your, um, uh, in your repealing trade or just cutting capital gains taxes. Uh, the hardest thing is to deal with the problems that are real but where the answers are difficult. And I acknowledge that it is very difficult to know what to say to that mayor uh, who came to the Kennedy Center. But answering that question and focusing your energy on what it does, takes to revitalize, to have a, a, the kind of growing middle class that has the values we have, that's the right place to be looking. And I'd rather be struggling uh, without all the perfect answers asking the right question than having simple, clear answers that are not addressing that. And I think whatever side you're on on the political spectrum, I just challenge you to look really hard at what, how difficult the problems are right now, how much they don't fit easily into either side. And I think if we can get people, and I think that Greg is one of those people, who may disagree on different elements, but understands that there are hard choices to make, that there is mutual sacrifice out there, that I do believe that people of goodwill are still capable in this country of working together and doing some big things. So thank you. Thank you all very, very much.